So I would like to finish today with a presentation on visionary color theory. I'm sure you've had plenty of lectures on color theory in general, but I want to focus more on visionary color theory. I'll explain that in a moment. Let's just define some basic terms and the most basic one being this, the color wheel. The color wheel is one of these kind of arbitrary representations of color and it's debated whether this is an accurate one or not. For example, we have a circle and we've divided the circle into 12 parts and 12 is the maximum number, a duodecagon, is the maximum division of a shape that we can distinguish. If I divided this into 14 or 16, your mind would probably have a hard time grasping what I've done. And so dividing it into 12, kind of like a clock, allows our mind to grasp, oh, okay, that's yellow on top, that's violet on the bottom, and so on. So uh, let's talk about basic terms. This is the top of the color wheel, you get yellow. And as you go down this side, you hit orange and red towards magenta and violet or purple. People have different terms for this last one. Uh, those are the warm hues. If I go down the other way through, let's call it lime green towards cyan blue and then indigo blue or ultramarine towards violet and so on is the cold side. <clears throat> As we move towards the center, the tones or values get darker. So you have the lighter tones here and the darker tones over there. So we've basically described two um, dimensions of color. We've talked about warm and cold hues and we've talked about tones. Uh, this interesting character, Philipp Otto Rung, uh, developed a correspondence with Goethe and since Goethe himself wrote a famous treatise on color and he was trying to find ways in which to imagine color not just as a wheel but as a sphere and with this sphere you would get white up here, you get black down at the bottom and then halfway would be grays but those grays would be more on the inside. <clears throat> and uh, it's another way if you want of visualizing color. He didn't just theorize about it. Philip Otto Rung also developed these beautiful compositions and then turned one of them, alas, not the other ones, into a huge painting. His four paintings were dawn, midday, dusk, and night. And so he wanted to show you the four times of the day and show you the colors at work in the four times of the day. He managed to paint dawn, but the other ones were never completed. We'll come back to this beautiful painting at the end of this presentation. Notice the child at the very bottom gazing upward into the dawn, uh, seeing color as if for the first time. So. I want to talk about spectral colors as the visionary colors. And if you look at any object like a flower with its green leaves, most objects give off a whole range of wavelengths. And I would argue that the most common color that we perceive in everyday perception is gray, which is not even a color. But gray is interwoven in all of our perception, dirtying your colors. And that's why many realistic painters will take the opposite of a green, say an orange, and put it in to dirty it, to give you that gray tone. Uh, because the opposite would be the rainbow or the prism. And now you are getting the pure colors, the pure colors of the visible spectrum. There's no gray. There's nothing to dirty those colors. And we, as visionary artists, we like spectral colors. So, I would like to now suggest that there's a third dimension to color. We talked about hue, and hue is one color wavelength of the spectrum, like red, orange, yellow, green, blue. Those are the different hues or chromas that we see. 
<clears throat> we talked about tone or value, which is to say you add white or black and you make it darker or lighter. So a, a light red versus a dark red, those would be different in terms of their tone, although they're the same hue. Last dimension I want to talk about is now saturation. And in the visionary uh, state, if you've witnessed certain visions, you will notice that the brightness of the colors is extraordinary and that they tend to be very highly saturated colors. And many visionary artists move towards highly saturated colors. The saturation is the natural, brightest, most intense hue. So giving us a red as opposed to, say, a pink. <clears throat> now, we as painters, we have to use pigments in order to paint. And something happens when we add white or black or gray to a pure color. Let's say I have a red. If I add white to that red, or if I add black, if you add white or black to a hue, this will increase the tone, making it lighter or darker, but decrease the color saturation, making it less intense. Every time I put white or black into my color, it's not as saturated anymore. And if I manage to find the same gray tone as that green or that red and put the gray in, it'll also kill the saturation, right? So every time we try and darken or lighten colors by adding white or black, we're killing the saturation. Which is why, incidentally, with the Misch technique, you put white and then you glaze a color on top and the white shines through and that preserves the highly saturated color. Uh, artists have known this throughout history and the prime example would be, say, Da Vinci and Michelangelo where Da Vinci knew that if you want to stress light and the contrast of light and dark, then you're going to have to sacrifice color. <clears throat> the moment you make something very dark or the moment you make it very light, you have to sacrifice the color. Um, <clears throat> of course, he did you know, use strong color here, but the majority has that beautiful chiaroscuro that we know Da Vinci. Michelangelo <clears throat> sacrificed the chiaroscuro in order to create stronger contrasts or differentiation at the level of color. And that's what allows the greens to, to play off of the oranges and yellows so strongly in this painting. So <clears throat> you, as an artist, kind of have to make a decision. Do you want to move towards the chiaroscuro and emphasize the dark and the light? Or do you want to move those more towards the mid-tone, and once you've got the mid-tone, you differentiate through hue. <clears throat> Let's uh, move to the world of fantastic realism. We're at the Vienna Academy of Visionary Art. Next door is the Fantastin Museum, dedicated to the five fantastic realists, Ernst Fuchs, Rudolf Hausner, Arik Brauer, Anton Lemden. Um, <clears throat> so this is Ernst Fuchs talking about his experience of color and how Rudolf Hausner influenced his perception of color. Ernst Fuchs wrote, Hausner's contribution was to sharpen our awareness of color through his many amiable critiques. He was able to demonstrate to us the many possibilities of polychromy and complementary colors so that it became eminently clear how painting had evolved since the time of the Gothics. And we are fortunate that Rudolf Hausner, who taught both at the Vienna, uh, the, the um, Akademie der Bildende Künste in Vienna and in Hamburg at the art school there, he uh, left behind writings. And this is one of his passages, which is in German, but I've translated it into English for us. And he talks about this idea of local color and polychromy. He writes, the painting of the old masters proceeds from the local color of the object. My painting proceeds from the color spectrum. The old masters painted a red ball in local color by using light red in the lights, dark red in the shadows, and they increased the volume of the object in that way. And this is a painting by van der Weyden, one of the old masters, and sure enough, you have dark and light reds to make those spheres. 
I paint a red ball using spectrum colors. For example, in the light, I put red-orange. On the shadow's border, I put violet. And in the backlight, I use green. And in this way, the ball painted a sphere in his uh, landscape. And the backlight is green, the front l r light is red, and where they meet, he's created a violet. And he's moved through the spectrum to create volume. So that's what we're going to look at pretty much uh, today, is how you move through the spectrum to create volume in a painting. This was his breakthrough work, his masterpiece, The Ark of Odysseus. He created it, failed, destroyed it, resurrected it, painted it again. It took him several years, but it was a key piece where he broke away from his Impressionist style, because he was an Impressionist, and moved into this field of fantastic realism. <clears throat> this is Hausner himself holding a cube with his parents and himself as a child. And this is the arc uh, of his life, so to speak. And you can see that he's starting to understand and implement spectral colors in his perception for the first time. And then as his painting advances, his understanding of spectral colors becomes clearer. We saw this, and now you get the opposite here, where the orange ground of this green ball creates a red reflection, but the light of the sky, which is basically you know, here, is giving us yellow and green. <clears throat> Uh, other examples then, as we move forward through his work, this is Adam, that's his self-portrait of Rudolf Hausner with this peculiar angle. And you can see that he's moving through the color spectrum in order to create the volume of this figure. <clears throat> he also made many paintings of his wife or various wives. He was married five times. And here he's even given us um, so to speak, the keys that he's using in this painting, where the red comes from, where the green comes from, and so on, uh, as if the notes of a musician playing uh, a melody. <clears throat> Opposites or complementary colors moving across the color wheel and the effects that they create. Uh, he was very interested in geometry, in projective geometry, and so on. And you can see him playing not just with color, but with space uh, in all of his works. So Rudolf Hausner was the great teacher of color, and that influenced Ernst Fuchs. Ernst Fuchs, in turn, influenced many, the next generation of artists like Robert Venosa and Alex Gray. So I would like to take a look at Alex Gray, because he also uses uh, spectral colors in his work. And uh, this is his image of a visionary artist. And I find it very interesting the way he views perception, that perception tends to be a more active projection of vision onto the canvas. And indeed, you have uh, angelic forces moving through the artist and finally projecting onto the canvas as well as the heart energies and so on informing the canvas and the colors that we use. Here's his image of a newborn child and it does cause you to wonder how does a child perceive the world. Uh, the poet Shelley in Queen Mab wrote, and all is wonder to unpracticed sense, which you know, as a child, you could not even distinguish squares from triangles from circles, that gradually your eyes focused onto patterns, and gradually from focusing onto patterns, started to distinguish colors and so on. And uh, it seems possible that when we enter into these deep visionary states, perhaps we are regressing into childhood perceptions of pattern and color. And Alex Gray has represented that through the spectrum. Yeah, we're moving from the cold, the greens, the lime greens, from actually the blues, to the greens, to the yellows, from the yellows to the orange to the red. He's moving through the spectrum and creating these bands, these shifting wave-like bands of spectral colors uh, in this painting. 
Another famous example by Alex Gray, Transfiguration, and uh, which is pretty much the accurate representation of both a dream and a DMT experience, where he saw these patterned lights. And when he paints the pattern light, he gives us white shifting to blue, blue becoming yellow, yellow into the warm spectrum of orange and red. <clears throat> that there is a definite system to the vibration of colors that happens within those patterns. <clears throat> Robert Venosa, uh, a student of Ernst Fuchs uh, and an inspiration to all of us and his masterpiece, The Astral Circus. I want to focus in on some of the figures like this one here and the bird over here and so on, the elephant as well. Uh, because he has created these beautiful, transparent, glass-like figures. And yet, I think we would be misled to think that he does not understand color or spectral color. That whenever he's creating these glass-like transparencies, he's thinking in terms of warm and cold, and where it's cold and where it's warm to give us these transparencies. And then, taking that a bit further, if you look at this elephant, for example, he's even playing with various cold or cool colors on one side of the elephant. We're kind of in this realm over here. And on the other side, he's playing with yellows and pinks and oranges, but very subtly. Not these strong, saturated colors, but spectral colors nevertheless, and thinking in terms of the spectrum. And that's what happens when light refracts off the surface of glass. If you're very sensitive to the way light refracts off the surface of glass, in certain places it's dark and transparent. In other places, the surface captures that play, that prismatic play of light. And uh, Venosa was a master at doing that. <clears throat> I am by no means a master, but I have played with uh, spectral color and our perception of light and pattern. Uh, this being the result of an ayahuasca journey and the patterns that I saw, which seemed to me like the soul patterns that make up uh, the entire web of life. I apprenticed with Ernst Fuchs and after apprenticing with him, I made this painting. And it was the first painting where I started to really understand what spectral color is. I didn't have a clear grasp of it, even at this point. I knew that I wanted to have this figure who's called Fanny's the light emerging from the cosmic egg, and his daughter, who is the night, which is to say shadow, is then obscuring the light, and as she obscures the light, it hits this central figure, uh, necessity, and refracts into these spectral colors. It was, and then this is the Orphic creation myth. You have this serpent at the top that represents time. As I painted this green, for the first time I understood that the shadows shift towards blue and that as I shifted from green to blue within one volume, I was moving through the spectrum. That became the key to me, and so when I started to move this, I started to move through the warm spectrum until finally the shadows ended up <coughs> in these violet or light violet hues. And so in a certain sense, I've moved from yellow all the way through the color wheel to violet, although skipping certain steps. Um, in the next painting, I said to myself, okay, let's try and move all the way through the spectrum as we do it. So, for example, here on the horizon, from yellow moving to orange, orange to pink, pink to magenta, magenta to violet, violet to blue, right? And then have that even occur, say, within the skin tone on the face of this figure, so that I'm taking the blue shadow of the night and bringing it into the shadow that you get here from the hair and moving through the spectrum as we move through all the colors. <clears throat> so once I had grasped that, I was able to then create a painting like this, which very consciously moves through the spectrum from yellow to orange to pink to magenta 
and then do that within all of these uh, finer figures or, or aspects. So each feather within the wing of this celestial bull uh, manages to actually move through the spectrum within each feather and it starts to acquire this glass-like quality. I also discovered the blue, that yellow and white against a dark background when they glow tend to create this bluish hue and in my next painting I wanted to explore that even further. The way that one color lights up another color that the yellow is lighting up the blue and it's but the blue itself wouldn't have its quality unless it was against a darker color like violet and so projecting itself on top of the violet. So these are all the various lessons I've been learning uh, as I've been painting and thinking in terms of spectral color although obviously I'm also thinking about geometry and, and so on <clears throat> and that is my conscious reconstruction of the things, the lessons I learned with Ernst Fuchs. He um, never explained spectral color to me directly, but he obviously expected me to understand and implement it when we were painting together. And so I had to grasp it first intuitively and next in a kind of conscious way. He himself, as he said, began like the Gothic painters, using mostly earth tones, semi-neutrals, the red imprimatura with browns on top, glazing warm and cold, but otherwise kind of staying within a certain range uh, in the volumes. None of the blue in the background ends up here. The Gothics didn't think in those terms. The Gothics respected each color area of each object. And slowly, as he started to glaze and glaze his works into existence, uh, just through the glazing process, colors started to mix and match and come through. And you can see he's using warms and colds, in this case, uh, to create the space within that painting. And in fact, the only thing that he ever said to me about color he turned and looked at me with this gaze and he said, color is space and left it at that. And I had to understand what he meant when he said color is space. And gradually it occurred to me that the space is the spectrum. And the question is how a volume exists within this spectrum of color space. So as he moved into his cherub period, you see his color is getting stronger, more psychedelic and visionary. <clears throat> and also uh, color vibrations happening. And to create those color vibrations, he's very consciously using the spectrum, just as we saw with Alex Gray, that there's a yellow here. That yellow strengthens the orange on one side, it strengthens the green on the other side. And then by lighting up the orange, the orange lights up the red. And on the cold side, the green, the lime green, lights up the cyan blue, which lights up the indigo blue. One color lights up the other because it's stronger. Violets, which you see kind of over here, don't have that strength. They tend to remain in the shadows. But yellow has the strength to light up the other colors. And there's that unique reflection of the cyan blue that we were talking about earlier. Um, <clears throat> the other thing that Fuchs mentioned to me is he said, I like those seashell colors. And seashell colors set me to thinking what exactly is going on here. When we paint in the Misch technique, we tend to use whites and semi-transparent whites to create volume, but also atmosphere. And as we create atmosphere, we place these soft whites semi-transparently over the darks in succession to create atmosphere. And as we do so, that white creates that haze of soft seashell colors. 
If you look at the way a seashell uh, itself refracts light, in fact, uh, as it grows, it grows various layers of chalk or calc in German, and these different layers of chalk allow refraction of light to occur at different levels. And so you get the pinks and the cyan blues and the lime greens and so on that create the play of light in a seashell. Uh, something to keep in mind because as we do the Misch technique we can actually try to imitate some of these effects. Instead of the lighter side of spectral colors, we can also pursue the darker side of spectral colors. That why not still seek saturated colors but darken them with darker tones until you start to get this play of colors that is not the light seashell colors but the deeply shadowy saturated colors. And sure enough, you know, Ernst Fuchs uh, pursued that as well. Uh, in this example, the Angel of History, which ends up uh, being in the Apocalypse Chapel in Clackenford, another version, not quite this version. So, uh, as he progressed as an artist, he got deeper and deeper into color. So far, in fact, that he lost a lot of his clients. Uh, people couldn't follow where he was going. During this Feuerfuchs period, as it's called, uh, Feuer being fire, um, he took his engravings from the late 50s, had them blown up onto canvases, and then as large canvases, he colored them in. And when he colored them in, he colored them in with these strong, vibrant, saturated colors, <clears throat> which to him created the vibrations of color space. And I have to confess that when I first saw these Feuer Fuchs period paintings, I also had a hard time uh, adjusting my perception to what he was trying to accomplish with these pieces. I had to, in a certain sense, uh, readjust my way of seeing in order to see into the painting. And once I did, it acquired tremendous depth and vibration. <clears throat> So let's take this as a great example. This is a drawing by Ernst Fuchs of Adam and Eve before the tree. Uh, it's a much more Gnostic interpretation of the temptation, which is to say that it is more of an angelic being which is offering the fruit, which is the fruit of knowledge. Contrapposto movement of Eve as well as Adam. He's very aware of the laws of contrapposto and the pose given to us through Greek and Renaissance art. <clears throat> now, how would you color in this drawing? What would you do to get a deeper tone in the background, a lighter tone in the foreground, mid-tones perhaps, and so on, play of light on the figures? Try and imagine how you would construct and color in this drawing. And now, let's look at what Ernst Fuchs did when he actually colored in that drawing. And you can see that he was not, he did understand that the background colors would probably be around here. Your violets and magentas would give you the background colors. He understood that white is your strongest color and so the white will then um, illuminate everything that comes after it. But then he started moving through the spectrum. And if we zoom into, say, this area over here, we can see that he definitely put in some yellows over here, and that those yellows light up oranges and reds on one hand, and greens on the other hand, the greens shifting not through blue, but immediately to magenta and violet. <clears throat> But he is thinking in terms of spectral colors as he's creating all these dis the different plays of light on the surfaces of the figures. <clears throat> okay. So let's talk about creating volume through color. And I come back to this idea that normally volume is created through gradations of light and dark. And that's what we're taught when we pick up a pencil and we use a pencil to render a volume. We're going to put the shadow over here. If we're lucky, we have toned paper for the mid-tone and we can add some whites with a white pencil. But otherwise, 
with a painting as well, will stay within one color, like red, and go from dark to light. In visionary art, as we saw, we go through the spectrum, and by going through the spectrum, we go through what Fuchs called color space. This is uh, his masterpiece. It took him 20 years to paint this. It reflects all the various stages of his development as an artist, beginning in the late 50s with this very Gothic style Christ, but moving through the cherub period where he developed translucent, crystalline, precious stone kind of surfaces, and then into the Feuerfuchs period with all these vibrations of color and so on. Over the course of 20 years, this painting reflected his development uh, as an artist and his perception as well. So, let's consider the figure's volume within a color space moving from yellow to violet. Remember the color wheel? Yellow at the top, violet at the bottom, and we're going to move from yellow to violet. And the question is, how do we move from yellow to violet? <clears throat> well, there's two ways. You can either move through the warm spectrum, which is what happens when you go from yellow to orange to pink and red around magenta. Or you can go through the cold spectrum, lime green and then darker green or uh, a greenish blue, turquoise, and then cyan blue, darker blues into the violets. That's the cold spectrum. <clears throat> That's our color space. Here's Christ. Obviously, he's focused on the warm spectrum over here. He's playing with his yellows and oranges and reds, maybe as deep as a magenta, in order to create all of the jewels and the flesh tones and so on in this area over here. But then as you get further back into the distance, you start to shift over to the yellows and the blues, which is to say into the cold spectrum. <clears throat> Let's look at the feet. And there's this amazing glow that he's created. The feet themselves stay within the warm spectrum, but the glow shifts from yellow to this lime green. And as the lime green goes further out, it becomes cyan blue and into the deeper blues and deeper greens and so on. Interestingly enough, he's then put in those cyan refractions of light that become the solarized shadow. The light in shadow, which is so strong that it actually glows and becomes that bluish tone. <clears throat> so we're moving both uh, through the warm spectrum, but also the cold spectrum in order to create this glow that you see, uh, this halo at the bottom. Uh, if you shift to the cherub, which you see on the left of Christ, that glow is definitely moving through the cold spectrum, from the yellows to the um, greens, the lime greens, and into the softer blues and the darker blues and so on. But then the background is starting to give it a little bit of a red tinge in the shadows. <clears throat> the other cherub uh, is actually translucent. The same thing is kind of happening, but then the red glow from behind passes through and from behind, the yellow and the red allow this glow from within, while the outer structure remains those colder colors. So you have a cold spectrum on top of a warm spectrum uh, in this other translucent cherub. <clears throat> Translucency raises a lot of problems. Jewels. If you want to create jewels, and Fuchs was a master, that all of these jewel-like shapes that you see on the wings, translucent jewels, here he's staying within the reds and using lights and darks to create those translucent jewels. But as he moves further in, he starts to use color, like Hausner, to create those same shapes until we get to something like this, which is almost entirely abstract. He's used the red and the blue to make the jewel, but we no longer see it quite so much as a jewel. And yet, as we go down here, we start to distinguish, ah, it is a jewel, but a very highly colored, saturated jewel, which then moves into what we perceive as a jewel. 
We're back to Michelangelo and da Vinci, if you want, chiaroscuro versus colori, and how uh, one can give us one form of information, the other the other form of information. There's no dark and light here, there's only contrasts of color. So this is the entire triptych that he's created, an altarpiece, and I just want to point out that it extends further, so he's taken now his violet and yellow color space and he's gone through the warm and cold spectrums in order to accomplish that. Let's just finish by looking at these interesting designs at the top and the bottom. And now he's uh, given up on any form of volume. The shapes look kind of flat. But he's using color in a way that's very interesting. If you can maybe even close your right eye so that you squint with your left eye open and start to imagine that there is a yellow semicircle here and this yellow light is now shining through and as this yellow light progresses through this semicircle and this semicircle it progresses from yellow towards violet and that's the color space. And within that color space, progressing from yellow towards violet, he's put semi-transparent colors on top. And that the yellow is actually lighting up the oranges, the yellow is lighting up the reds, lighting up all those warm colors. And at the same time, the yellow is lighting up that cyan blue from behind. And as it lights up that cyan blue, which becomes transparent, the cyan blue deepens into a darker blue, which we see happening over here. And these crystalline shapes become three-dimensional with the yellow lighting up, even the cyan, uh, sorry, the lime green over here, the cyan, the blue, and so on. It's a fascinating uh, exercise in perception and seeing translucent color space uh, in the construction of this chalice-like tower with the name of God, Yahweh, <clears throat> inscribed with the crystalline flames on either side. Really a beautiful thing. At the bottom of that altarpiece, you get this. And I've spent many hours puzzling over this, and I still can't quite decide what he's trying to do here. It seems to be some kind of color wheel or uh, definition of space and color, but where I can see clearly at the top what he's trying to do, at the bottom here, the principles are not as clear to me as they are above. One of those mysteries that we can contemplate and come back to again and again. So I want to finish then with the Apocalypse Chapel in Klagenfurt here in Austria. I was fortunate through the invitation of Amanda Sage and Andrew Gonzalez to uh, go there and work with Ernst Fuchs. And then once we met, uh, we got on very well. And so I became his assistant. And as a paid assistant, my wife, Florence Menard, and myself then moved to Monaco and lived with him for a year. And I basically initiated myself deeper into uh, his painting techniques, but also his visionary world. So it all started here in the Klagenfurt Chapel, and I've since been able to go back several times and work there. This is the way it looks today. It's now finished. And uh, for myself, I'm a bit surprised because uh, so many assistants have worked there that parts of his original vision have actually been covered over. And we'll see that in terms of the execution of this wall. You have the Virgin of the Apocalypse here. The, she's described as with her feet on the crescent moon. And then she gives birth to a child which the beast with seven heads wants to devour. But the Archangel Michael defeats the beast with the seven heads and so the child escapes and eventually becomes uh, Christ the judge of the living and the dead. This is all from the book of the Apocalypse. This is the way it is today. 
This is the way it was when I was working with Ernst Fuchs in the year 2000. And you can see that they had actually put a grid here to better define the sphere. That there was all these interesting shapes in the background which eventually were totally covered over by this landscape. And most importantly, the wings of the Archangel Michael were in this state of development when I was working with Fuchs. And I spent some time looking at those wings and trying to understand what's going on here. Now, this is behind the altar in the chapel, which is to say the main focus uh, of the entire chapel. And you have this fiery flame, which is actually uh, an eye, that uh, you see this huge sphere like the sun, and as if uh, in that another sphere. So you have this fiery red sun or eye, and in front of it you have the crescent moon. And that two light sources then create the light space. Remember color space? We talked about yellow and violet as being the two limits of a color space. Well, let's shift that and say reddish, orange, pink, pinkish, orange will be one limit of our color space and lime green will be the other limit of our color space and see what happens when we define the figures in terms of those limits. So consider the figure's volume within a color space moving from lime green foreground light to an orange pink background light because this figure here is standing with it uh, in front of the orange pink but with some of the green influencing the volume. This is Ernst Fuchs now, his distinctive brushwork. I don't think anyone could have painted this part. It's so distinctively his. And what is he doing when he's painting this upper portion over here? He's allowed the inner glow from behind to move from the yellow and the oranges towards the pinks and the deeper reds. And as those reds get deeper and deeper and deeper, they eventually become magenta and then the magenta is almost the outer limit of that warm spectrum from the sun. Once that backlight reaches its limit, it hits the foreground light, which are the greens. And those greens are coming from the opposite direction and moving from greens to blues, cyan blues, deeper blues, and then into their own uh, magentas as well as uh, violets inside here. So he's moving from the cold spectrum this way and from the warm spectrum that way okay, to create this simple drapery or wings of uh, the Archangel Michael moves through the entire warm and cold spectrum within that space. Pretty miraculous if you ask me. Uh, <clears throat> this is now, we were looking at the upper part over here. Now we're going to look at the bottom part over here in more detail. And you can see that the same thing is basically happening, except now the cold spectrum is starting to pre predominate in those greens which become blues. And these, are, these become shadows, but they become solarized shadows. Right? The, the, the cold colors become the light in shadow of the warmer colors. <clears throat> And so the, you can imagine shadow itself having a spectrum of colors, as well as outer volumes having another spectrum of colors. Uh, now I'm going to shift over here and start to ask ourselves, what's he doing? And <clears throat> he's clearly decided, well, where do I start? I start with the cold, so I start with the lime green. And where do I start with the warm? I start with these orange pinks. And he just lays them down really strongly. And then he knows he's going to work towards that, that these greens will eventually develop into blues and so on. And these pinks will eventually have a lighter yellow 
on top of them, and maybe a deeper red in their shadows, and so on. Yeah? And he, he knows that these are the warms, these are the colds, and he's going to work towards one direction and the other direction to eventually create this spectacular volume. This is now the knee of the Archangel Michael and the drapery falling over the knee. And you can still sense that the lime green and the uh, warm pinkish orange are there and they're contrasting each other. They're meeting each other at the highlight. <coughs> but then they're spectrally dividing as they move out into the shadow. <coughs> Unfortunately, what we just looked at was lost. It was painted over numerous times. Uh, here you can see it's pretty much been... This could have been actually what's underneath here. I'm not entirely sure. Uh, but definitely by the end, this is what you get. And I find that while this is interesting, I don't see the principles at work <clears throat> the way I do over here. Uh, so we've lost, in a certain sense, uh, all of that interesting spectral play of colors uh, over time. <clears throat> Other parts of the chapel are not so overworked. And this is the Angel of History. Uh, I was only able to photograph it from this height because this is the platform that we were standing on to paint. It's really twice the size of a man. Um, <clears throat> and you can see that this has been repainted multiple times as well, but he was definitely thinking in terms of, well, I have the moon, which is green, and I have the sun, which is pinkish orange, and it's casting its light over the, all the figures in the chapel. This one is at the side wall and yet it's still receiving that pink and green. This is at the back wall, and even this figure uh, on the back wall is receiving pink and green as the dominant colors, which is to say the color space that I described isn't just the color space of one painting, but all the paintings in the chapel. And uh, this is uh, to the left of the main uh, painting in the chapel, this image of Christ with this amazing drapery. And uh, you have Christ here, hands up, his heart rendered in this beautiful impressionistic style. And as I zoom into the heart, you can see that play of pink and green again over these hatchings, glazed softly to create that play of light, warm, cold. So I would like to finish this presentation on spectral color with uh, this painting by Ernst Fuchs called The Paradiso. It was unfinished and in progress at the time that I was working with him in Monaco. And he told me that basically it is his version of Philip Otto Rung's Dawn that he's exploring color in this painting and how basically the eye perceives color, especially the perception of light as seen through these miraculous visionary plant or tree surrounded by two angels which were then further developed. And if we zoom in then to this area over here, uh, you can see that and it was really, to see this in the original painting is really beautiful. These soft, transparent beams of light which are then glazed over with these warmer tones over the cold green background. So you get this play of warm light over colder uh, background all through the piece. And it just glistens in a, in a way that's really quite amazing. So, with those thoughts in mind of color and visionary color, I just want to conclude this talk thinking that what we know about color um, is not finished, that we will continue to expand our perception of color. That's what I mean by visionary color. And uh, we've by no means reached the end, rather through the explorations that we're doing here at the Academy. I think that we can push 
the perception of color even beyond anything that I've presented to you today. It's just up to you to accomplish it in your various canvases. Okay, thank you very much for listening, and that's the end of today's lecture.